Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this morning's sessions and that you had a relaxing lunch after Rosario's presentation. We're delighted to see everyone back. Um, and it's my pleasure now to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker, Elena Norlin. Elena is currently the Professional Development DEI Coordinator for the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries. For those of you not familiar with ACERL, um, it is an organization of 38 research, libra research libraries drawn from the states along the Gulf Coast of the US and on up the East Coast we, get, we have members as far north as Maryland. Um, Elena is an accomplished teacher, technology and leadership development trainer and writer with extensive leadership experience and a flair for public relations, sales and communications. To date, she has delivered over 40 workshops, training sessions, presentations and institutes nationally and internationally on marketing, web usability design, employee engagement, strategic influence, and con conflict management. Self-motivated and results-oriented, she is well known for her ability to juggle many projects at once. She is the author of three books, Usability Testing for Library Websites, E-Learning and Business Plans, National and International Case Studies, and the six steps to library employee engagement. So please join me in welcoming Elena to the podium. So we're gonna get started. Um, just a little bit of background before I start my presentation. Do I go, no, go right here. Is um, the book that we did, my third book on the six steps, is actually based on research that I did for about a year. Um, I interviewed about 300 companies, uh, both nationally and internationally. Um, I, the question that I was very, very curious of when I started my research was, what did companies do to actually provide a healthy workplace environment and where everybody was excited about being at the environment? And then what did we, in sometimes intentionally and then sometimes not so intentionally do to actually lower morale and cause a dysfunctional environment. And so my quest was to find success stories and my quest was to talk to people and actually see if there was patterns of trends and behaviors that libraries could benefit from. So the most of the research that I did wasn't based on libraries per se. It was actually based on national um, and international companies, some for profit, a lot for not for profit. And then I used that lens to look at libraries. So I just wanted to give you that, that some of these things are like, I don't know if libraries are doing that because some of the times we're not, but this is a good review of that. So I always start with this is because this is actually something I actually bring up in the questions when I do DEI related training. And a lot of times I think we make things a lot more complicated than it is. And I also have to let you know that I'm a crossword puzzle. You know, I will sit and do crossword puzzles for hours. I am, I was a math geek in, in um, high school and college. So I love to get at the root of things at all times, right? And I love to figure out how to make things that seem really, really complex, simple. So even the other two books that I wrote was how to take something that seemed and appeared on surface to be really, really complex and then to simplify it. So when you look at these two statements, when I start, I tell the people when I even start with my DEI research, I, a lot of times people, are, when they try to figure out how to get started, I always say, can we get started looking at these statements and if we agree with them or not. It seems pretty simple statements that yes, of course we agree with that. But when we look at our global statistics in terms of engagement, in terms of people being happy at work, in terms of retention, in terms of people wanting, feeling like they're valued, respected, um, we're about 30% of the organization 
people and organizations feel that way. So even though these statements that you see right in front of you seem very, very, this seems really simple, right? But a lot of times the work that gets us to these statements is not as easy. Going back to what Rosario said in the first the session about mindfulness, what I always give with people in the steps is that we really need to put the energy into this work in order to get us to where this is at. I think a lot of times we spend a lot of our energy looking outwardly. We, we do our strategic plans, we do our goals, we do all of those things to best suit what is going on with our customers and how to support our customers. And that's really great. And that goes to our second statement, sort of. But we don't spend the same amount of time and energy about how to do our internal customers and how to get to this level. And I always say that if we can't see it, we don't acknowledge it, we can't change it. So a lot of times when you want to do this work is acknowledging what we're doing well and grow what we're doing well. And then also acknowledge what we're not doing so well. And that's okay. Because if we acknowledge it, we can change it. Another thing before we get to this, I, I love reading about Rihanna. Um, you know, as you know, she went from sort of um, sort of hip hop rap star goddess to billionaire. And I know a lot of people have looked into her business when she, you know, went from sort of tackling the cosmetic industry and eventually the fashion industry to become a billionaire. One of the things that I, I'm fascinated when I read about her story is the resiliency of her wanting to do something different. Because when you think about it, when she started with makeup, it's not like she wasn't the only celebrity that went into makeup, right? It's not like makeup is not already a gazillion dollar business already. Like what is she actually contributing to that business that will make it even more unique, right? There's nothing there. And we've been hearing from multiple sources that her makeup in comparison to the other makeup isn't even that the best makeup, right? I mean, it's been told over and over again, she doesn't have the best makeup. But what was she willing to do that others were not? She was willing to chip through the surface. The other makeup companies were like, when it came to inclusion and making sure everybody was seen, right? They were like, well, let's throw in one or two more shades of foundation and then, you know, there's videos. That's, if you type in videos of people before Rihanna came in, putting together different foundations to make their shade, there was a lot of videos of take this color and take that color and take this color and take that color and blend it all together. And you're like a scientist to try to figure these things out. But when she came to them and said, I want a shade for everybody, she didn't, everybody didn't just jump up and say, yes, let's do that she faced a lot of resistance towards that. It was not something that was um, embraced, right? It, it took a, a major risk to do that. But if we look at our, the demographics who mainly buy her makeup and the reason that she became a billionaire, they saw this as essential, right? Even though the makeup is not as great as other makeup uh, companies that have been around for hundreds of years, she's the billionaire, right? Because people see themselves. So I'm not saying that that statement of making sure everybody sees themselves is easy, but I wanna challenge you guys that if you are able to get away from just the surfacey stuff and you really are able to transform your environments to feel included for everyone, you will stand, you will shine more than everybody. Only one to 5% of companies all over the world are at a spot where people are saying that I feel included, regardless of whether I'm the security guard, I'm the cleaning staff, I'm just shelving books, I feel included, about one to 5%. If you guys are at one to 5%, you are literally going to outshine whatever organization you are, you will be the model. You will probably get more money. You'll probably be asked to travel around the world because it's not as often as people are doing that. So I challenge you when you look at it and you think about Rihanna, you think about the concept that people are looking for this 
this, like, let's not just take around the edges and let's dig in. Just always look at her like she was a hip hop goddess, goddess who became a billionaire. So I decided to do something a little bit different. I usually do a lot of polls and stuff like that, but this time I wanna do videos. Um, this first video that I have is called Great Place to Work. I did go to Great Place to Work when I was doing my research for my book. They're based in the Bay Area. Um, they are the ones that do all the research for the top 100 companies in the world that not only are most productive, but people love working there. They are the ones that have done the research. They've been doing the research for about 30 years. Um, Michael there in the thing is the person who's the CEO of the company, and he's gonna sort of break down the research um, from sort of his results. We survey CEOs, police officers, truck drivers, cooks, engineers. If people are working, we've surveyed them. And what we know in terms of their happiness, workers all want the same things. There's 3 billion working people in the world, and about 40% of them would say they're happy at work. That means about 1.8 billion, or almost 2 billion people, are not happy at work. What does that do, both to those people and the organizations that they work in? Well, let's talk about money. Organizations that have a lot of happy employees have three times the revenue growth compared to organizations where that's not true. They outperform the stock market by a factor of three. And if you look at employee turnover, it's half that of organizations that have a lot of unhappy employees. The miracle thing is you don't have to spend more money to make this happen. It's not about ping pong tables and massages and pet walking. It's not about the perks. It's all about how they're treated by their leaders and by the people that they work with. So I'd like to share a few ideas that create happy employees. Idea number one, in organizations where employees are happy, what you find is two things are present, trust and respect. Leaders often say, we trust our employees, we empower our employees. And then when an employee needs a laptop, and this is a true example, 15 people have to approve that laptop. So for the employee, all the words are right, but 15 levels of approval for a $1,500 laptop, you've actually spent more money than the laptop on the approval. And the employee feels maybe they're really not trusted. So what can an organization do to have a high level of trust? The first organization that comes to mind is Four Seasons. They have magnificent properties all around the world. And their employees are told, do whatever you think is right when servicing the customer. To hand that trust to your employees, to do whatever they think is right, makes the employees feel great. And this is why they're known for delivering some of the best service in the world. Idea number two, fairness. The thing that erodes trust in our organization faster than anything else is when employees feel that they're being treated unfairly. Employees want to be treated the same, regardless of their rank or their tenure or their age or their experience or their job category compared to anyone else. When I think about great organizations who get fairness right, the first organization that comes to mind is Salesforce. They found that men and women working in the same job with the same level of proficiency were making different amounts of money. So immediately, they calculated the difference and they invested $3 million to try and balance things out. Idea number three is listening. So to be a listener who connects with all types of people, we have to unlearn a few things. We've all been taught about active listening and eye contact and intense stare and a compassionate look. That's not listening. Repeating what the person says, that's not listening being humble and always hunting and searching for the best idea possible, that's what listening is. And employees can feel whether you're doing that or not. They wanna know when they talk to you and share an idea, did you consider it when you made a decision? The one thing that everybody appreciates and wants when they're speaking is to know that what they say matters so much, you might actually change your mind. Otherwise, what's the point of the conversation? We all know the things we need to change, the things that we need to do differently. The way you behave, the way you treat others, the way you respond, the way you support, defines the work experience for everyone around you. Changing to be a better person, the world is littered with those failures. But changing because there's something you believe in, some purpose that you have, where you're willing to risk almost everything because it's so important to you, that's the reason to change. If it's not, you should probably find a different place to work.
So thanks. You know, interesting story is um, when I went to a um, great place to work, they recommend Salesforce. So I met with a group of BIPOC people from Salesforce because Salesforce, you know, did tell me that they invested millions of dollars to improve their employee experience, but I was skeptical. The librarian and me needed more evidence, right? So um, I actually, when I met with the group of people and they were from all over the world from Salesforce, they were so freaking happy to be at work. They almost convinced me to not to be a librarian and actually join their company. And they even told me that if I ever wanted to join their company, let them know they'll get me started on the track. I mean, it was, it was sickeningly happy there. I mean, and I'm an upbeat person and it was a little bit, a lot for even me. So they have, they, they did put their money where their mouth is. And the reason why Salesforce is always on the top five list and a great place to work is because they did put the time and energy into it. So the next thing is I wanted to give you for the librarians of the world, and I know because I am one, is you guys want like, what do we, what is the breakdown of what to do here, right? Here is a chart of some of the things that consistently need to happen. Um, doesn't mean that you need to change all of these things overnight, but these are sort of the consistent patterns that I saw over and over again when I was talking to people. First thing, um, it's not in any order, right? So first thing is conflict resolution. Um, getting that right. Um, more times when I talk to organizations, especially the ones that were dysfunctional and literally were falling apart, said there was so much people, trauma and org things that had happened to people that weren't resolved, that had ma managed to fester within the organization and sort of eroded trust and all these other different things. Doesn't mean that every conflict is going to be done, but the organizations that I did talk to who were doing better had really systems in place that if there was a major conflict, they had the tools to be, they had someone like a group of people. In some cases, they had a committee that that's what they did is they gathered tools and they gathered resources so people can be able to resolve conflict at that time but it was actual committee that was looking at that and helping support that. When we say teamwork, it also just not just means joining teams, but people feel a part of the organization. They all feel connected. They all feel like we're doing something together. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about teamwork as it, the number one thing that erodes teamwork is trust, right? But going, not only just being able to do teams, but everybody feels that they have pride in what in their organization. So a, a good example is that it's, it's like if we're doing something well, we wanna celebrate it as a team. We wanna say that this is why we're working here. It's a little bit of brainwashing a little bit to me, but it is still in a positive way. We have to, people need to feel like they're part of something special. Uh, recognition and praise. Um, in, in my book, I spent a whole chapter writing about this. This is something that we can do and it's free. It's absolutely free and doesn't cost any money. Someone like Salesforce end up spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for some kind of software that does it. I think you guys have seen it on TV where they actually show you software that allows you to do that. But you don't need software to do the recognition and praise. A lot of times for us at libraries, we do like we do a staff recognition and we do, you know, and we, you know, do an extra thing with performance evaluation or we get bonuses. Those are great. But what I mean about recognition and praise is how can we figure out a way for everyone to see, be seen, right? Um, when I was a manager, I was, I was diligent about trying to, to shine a light on people who normally didn't, wasn't seen. So that was the people shoving the books. That was our students. That was, that was our cleaning staff. That was our security guard. That was people who, there was always gonna be our superstar shiners. And I'm not saying that we didn't wanna acknowledge them, but there was always people in our organizations, right? Who are not going to be flying to Cambridge. They're not gonna be whatever. They're gonna be quietly doing their work. They're the glue that makes things run. They're the people who are never going to be looking like they're outshining anything because their job is just doing very specific day-to-day -day things. And how do we let them know that they're special, they're valuable, their foundational work is what gets us to grow. And it's an active programming for us to recognize them. 
One of the suggestions that I did, and you can borrow it, is that I would commonly uh, have hundreds of thank you notes. And I would write thank you notes to people all the time, not for doing over and above things, but just, hey, I see you. I know I saw what you did there. Uh, you know, you're great. You know, you have a great day. You have a great week um, because, you know, you're wonderful. And it really made a difference. I mean, I can't tell you how fast morale started to change when people started to be seen. What I mean by leadership consistency is that when I travel, and I travel quite a bit to organizations across the country, um, what I the for leaders for you guys to know where the um, where the low morale is usually at is in the middle. It's in the middle. So I hear deans and directors tell me, oh, you know, I think everything's going well. But the, the, the problem is usually in the middle. There's usually a leadership inconsistency, meaning that there's one department that's thriving and everybody's happy. And there's another department that people are not thriving. And the leader there is problematic and they don't trust the organization to do anything about it. So they suffer in silence. And then there's another group that the, the manager is a nice person, but doesn't acknowledge them, is too busy to pay any attention to them. They feel very apathetic because the person is just not inspiring them. It's not like that person's bad, but we, we need to figure out how, what, what do we, how do we wanna treat people? How do we really want people to feel when they're in our organization and make sure that all of our leadership within our, all of our supervisors are on the same page. They're not the same people, but we're on the same page. Trust we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, performance evaluation is another thing that is a um, under, thing that we can do that we don't realize. I remember when I was a regional manager, someone came to me and said, Elena, the least that we can do is make people feel good during the performance evaluation. Um, we, I, had, I, I always tell the story um, about one of my branch managers, when it came time for their year of review, would write glowing recommendations about people. I had to sign off on it. And he made people walk on water. I mean, I have never seen someone write such glowing reviews about people. I mean, I, and I knew the people. And so I always go like, is this really Joe? Is this Joe? Really, this is Joe. And he would always tell me, this is not Joe, this is Joe's potential. I always write about what I've seen about Joe for the year, and then I write where I know Joe can go. He said, I expect the best from my employees and I tend to get that. But I always write to Joe, I always tell Joe he can, he can expand a little bit more. He said, and they always surpass my expectations. He said, I don't have a staff member who does not surpass my expectations. And it is true because I always, my funny story is that I would go visit um, that department when he was out of town expecting them to be goofing off and they were still at high productivity. And I was like, you guys can goof off a little bit. You know, he is gone. They were like, no, 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 no. We would never do that. I mean, they were converted, right? And I always tell people that, you know, yes, it is to put out mistakes, but is there also a chance to really inspire our employees what do we want them to do? Give them instructions of where we want them to be. And if we motivate them, they, as, as Tim is the guy, always says they always exceed expectations. Um, but uh, permission to fail is, I know a lot of times we say that, oh yeah, people can fail, but I commonly find that when people make mistakes, I've, I can't tell you how many employees tell me that I made a mistake five years ago and they're still telling me about it. So I'm not making any more mistakes. So if we say that, yes, there is permission to fail. We have to follow that up with action. A few more things and we'll get back to videos is I want people to look at this. This was an aha moment. I, um, someone showed me this at, when I was at Great Place to Work in the Bayside about um, Maslow hierarchy and needs as it relates to the workplace. The things that I want you to notice here in this particular slide is that when you look at it from the hierarchy of needs, security is where our um, money is, and it is also where our um, uh, 
benefit packages and stuff like that. And so if I had a dollar for every time a manager, when I go to do leadership training, tell me, I just need to get staff more money and they'll be happy and they'll be engaged. I would not be here. I would be in Hawaii sipping out of my tide. So um, that is not true. More money could get people to be more engaged, but it's not a guarantee. It is actually moving towards belonging importance. And self-actualization, it means that people feel that they are transformed within the workplace. And that is only about one to 2% of companies across the world, right? That's, that's pretty high. Most play people are aspiring to get to belonging. And when you think about the whole DEI work, when we look at DEI related work, that's exactly where belonging is. But a lot of times when we look at DEI, they take, they, they look at salaries like, well, we could just give somebody a job and give them some benefits and then they'll be happy. No, not necessarily. When we're looking at the I and inclusion, we're looking actually at that belonging spot, which is a little bit higher up. We want to then look at of what can we do, the recognition and praise, the performance evaluation, conflict resolution. Those are the other intangibles that we need to bring just a job, a, you know, paycheck, benefits, position description, go, right? So what else can we do in order to move our employees up that chain and feel that they're more engaged? So we're now gonna take a look at trust. I'm gonna show you another video. Uh, this is the guru of employee engagement, um, which is Simon. Um, and he's got 10,000 videos. I took his shortest video, um, but this is very interesting when it relates to trust. I work with the Navy, I've worked with the Navy SEALs. And I asked them, like, who do you, how do you pick like the guys that go on SEAL Team 6, right? Because they're the best of the best, the best of the best. And they drew, a, they drew a graph for me. And on one side, they, drew, they wrote the word performance. And on the other side, they, were, they wrote the word trust. The way they define the terms is performance on the battlefield and performance off the battlefield. So this is your skills. This is, did you make your quarterly earnings? Whatever, however you want to translate it, right? Performance, it's traditional. This is, how are you off the battlefield? What kind of person are you? The way they put it is, I may trust you with my life, but do I trust you with my money and my wife? This is what they told me. Nobody wants this person, the low performer of low trust, of course. Of course, everybody wants this person, the high performer of high trust, of course. What they learned is that this person, the high performer of low trust, is a toxic leader and a toxic team member. And they would rather have a medium performer of high trust, sometimes even a low performer of high trust, it's a relative scale, over this person. This is the highest performing organization on the planet, and this person is more important than, than this person. And the problem in business is we have lopsided metrics. We have a million and one metrics to measure someone's performance and negligible to no metrics to measure someone's trustworthiness. And so what we end up doing is promoting or bonusing toxicity in our businesses, which is bad for the long game because it eventually destroys the whole organization. The irony is it's unbelievably easy to find these people. Go to any team and say, who's the asshole? And they'll... <laughs> they will all point to the same person. <laughs> Equally, if you go to any team and say, who do you trust more than anybody else? Who's always got your back? And when the chips are down, they will be there with you. They will also all point to the same person. It's the best gifted natural leader who's, getting, who's creating an environment for everybody else to succeed, and they may not be your most individual highest performer but that person, you better keep them on your team. So that's a, that one is really, really interesting to me because when I usually show that video, people go, well, we're, you know, libraries are not like that and we are 100% like that. We have a thousand and one metrics to do performance and we rarely look at trust metrics. Uh, one of the things that I always tell people when, especially when they come and have me come in for leaders, is remember when I told you morale problems are usually in the middle, right? And a lot of times we go for the 
the, the flashy technical objects. They've got X, Y years of experience. They've got, you know, they're from Yale. What does that have to do with anything? They're from Yale. They did this, they did that. They, they have a lot of technical expertise. So we're gonna hire them and have them run 25 people, right? I can't tell you how many times where literally things are falling apart and they know, everybody knows, as he says, I don't curse, but you know that, that person in the room and they won't do anything about it because that person is such a high performer. What I will always be told is, oh, I know that person is, is, is eroding morale, but they, and they start citing to me all of their accomplishments. They're so wonderful. They did this, they did that, they did this. And my, th my pushback on that all the time is, what does that have to do with leading people, right? What is that, does that skill set go to leading people? And in a sense, when we look, when we start to really look at our leadership, we really want to start, as we do succession planning, we want to make sure that we're talking to our staff and finding out what are those intangibles, what are those soft skills? Those are, that's the trust matrix. That's all he's talking about. What are the soft skills that we need to uh, lead our organization and make sure there's a balance. They're just not saying to throw a performance out the window, but it's also to say that we need to look at a different matrix. So this quick one, um, I can go forever on this one. And if you want me to talk about it, please come and talk to me about it because uh, it's, it's really in depth and I can talk about it for probably hours. But what I wanted to stress here for the workplace environment, a lot of times when we start looking at the environment, the first thing that we do is a climate survey. Now let's survey the climate. And when you look at the slide, um, uh, the, um, the graphic here, the climate is what you can see, right? And the reason why we have some of the things that are you know, brown and some of the things are green is everybody is not having the same experience in your organization. So everybody is not having the same experience in your organization. Someone sitting next to you can be having a completely different experience. So when we look at climate, I always caution people that they, even if they say 70% of people are happy and 30% of people are unhappy, that's not in that statement before. We wanna make sure that everybody is having a good experience. And we don't know how many of those people are lying because they don't want to feel bad because they're one of the people who don't feel quite so great about working there. There's a lot of peer pressure for them to feel that, that everything is okay. Norms, what I always tell people when they want to do this kind of work is to look at our norms. If we are under the statement that we want to make sure that everybody is having, uh, feeling valued, a lot of times in our norms, and our norms are our day-to-day -day operations. It's the, you, you need to come in at nine o'clock. It's the, we get three days out uh, and you, you know, three days at work and two days hybrid. It's the, we do our performance evaluations once a year in July or whatever. It's the day-to-day -day operations of how we guide our sort of internal operations. Have we looked at those things and see if any of those things still are valuing people over policy? And if they're not, what can we do to change those things? A lot of times when we look at climate surveys, we get the results and we don't really know what to do. And I always tell people the first thing that we need to do is go look at our policies, see if something needs to be changed. And people are like, we can't change policy. And I say, that's BS. Because when we went into the pandemic, we changed and went home really quick and we were able to change policies fast. We can change them if we want. So, but it is taking that time to look at them and see what can be modified. When you look at culture, culture is much harder, right? In the picture, it is the potatoes and the carrots and stuff. It's the things that you can't see. A lot of things that are in our organizations are things that are unwritten. It is things that they're like, we do things this way, right? And it's not written down anywhere. You just, you've been told that this is how things go. You don't know the origin of how things go or why this is the way it is. Sometimes you find it out after a few months, but this is what happens. A lot of times I get people who go, I just got here two months ago and I know what's going on. I'm like, you're a liar. You're not going to figure out anything that's going on for at least six months to a year. And any, any dean or director comes in and says, I'm going to change this place around without spending the six to six months to figure out what's going on is in for a lot of disappointment. 
it takes six to eight months. If you hear any consultant that says, I can come in and change your culture by walking in for a day, they're a liar. It takes six to eight months to figure out the culture. And the only way a consultant can figure that out is if they tell you that this is what's going on. The few times that, you know, the times that I've actually been able to transform cultures when I've done consultant work is because somebody has sat down and told me what the culture was. Straight, no chaser. You can't change what you're not willing to acknowledge. Last thing we wanna talk about really briefly is uh, psychological safety. Uh, this is really the core of trust. There's some people in your organizations right now that don't feel safe. And what I mean safe is that they don't know if they have a job. They don't know if they don't conform to things that don't make them feel comfortable. They're going to job is at jeopardy. Uh, they don't feel because of their color of their skin, their job might be at jeopardy. Whatever safety it is, they don't feel safe at work. And this is a problem. This is also what adds to burnout and other things because people are afraid to stand up because if they stand up, they feel retaliated against. So they end up complying, they end up doing more with less and all these other different things. I just read the global Gallup's global report today that says that 50% of our global population is under duress right now. It was the global report, 50%. And a lot of them is because the root problem is that they don't feel safe. And if they felt safe to say, hey, I'm burned out, I can't do anymore. They feel like they're gonna be penalized, retaliated against, unsafe, right? What we always can do is when we open up the lines of communication, we want people to feel safe that they can say stuff without retribution. Here's good old Simon again. He's, he's shorter this time. If you go back to the Paleolithic era, when Homo sapien first stepped foot on the planet, um, about 50,000 years ago, there were other hominid species that existed at the same time, but we were the ones that survived. They died. We weren't necessarily the strongest, we weren't necessarily the fastest, and yet we've done quite well. Look at this remarkable world that we've built. One of the huge advantages we had, and have, is that we are social animals. And things like trust and cooperation are absolutely essential for our survival. They're not just nice ideas. They're absolutely essential. Um, you can imagine why. When we existed, when we lived in populations that never really got bigger than about 150 people, for 40,000 of the 50,000 years we've been on this planet, we never lived in populations bigger than 150 people. I understand scale presents some inherent problems. Um, but you can, you can understand the benefits of the group living. What it meant was I could fall asleep at night and trust that someone in my tribe would watch for danger. If I didn't trust the people in my tribe, I couldn't go to sleep. And this is not a very good system for survival or performance or anything, any other metric. It's the same at work. When we work with people with whom we trust, I don't need to double check your work. I don't need to see it before it goes out to, you know, I don't need, you don't need my approval, right? When we have trust, we can let people go do their work and even if they're subordinate, we don't need to double check or approve or anything. Things will happen because we trust them, because we all have each other's backs. We all have each other's interests in mind. The problem with things like trust and cooperation is that they are not instructions. I can't simply tell you, trust me. You can't simply ask people to trust you in your advertising, and you can't simply tell people, I want you two to cooperate. Trust and cooperation are feelings, and this is the problem. So the question is, where do those feelings come from? Now again, we are basic, pretty simple in, in our motivation and our constructions. You can imagine what life, what color should I use? You can imagine what life must have been like in these Paleolithic times. It was a world filled with danger. All of these forces working extremely hard to kill us. Whether it was the weather or lack of resources, saber-toothed tiger, Nothing personal, but all of these forces were working together to end our lives. And so, as tribal animals, we worked together and lived and worked amongst people around whom we felt safe. We felt like we belonged. And when we felt safe amongst the people with whom we lived and worked, the natural human response is trust and cooperation. It's just what happens. 
When we do not feel safe amongst the people with whom we work, however, the natural human inclination is cynicism, paranoia, mistrust, and self-interest. When we do not feel safe amongst the people with whom we work, if our leaders do not make us feel safe, we have no choice but to spend our own time and our own energy to protect ourselves from each other. When we do not fear each other, we naturally work together to face the dangers and seize the opportunities. It's the exact same thing in our modern business world. There are forces that are a constant and beyond our control that are working to kill you, right? Maybe I'm exaggerating. But there are forces outside, things like the uncertainty of an economy, the ups and downs of a stock market, a new technology that might render a business model obsolete overnight, um, your competition that sometimes is trying to kill you. It's trying to destroy that product or put you out of business, but at the very minimum is trying to frustrate your growth and steal your customers. These forces um, uh, are a constant and you have no control over them and never will. The only variable are the conditions inside the organization. And when those conditions are set in a manner that allows us to feel like we can trust and cooperate, we do. This is what leaders are supposed to do. So I, I, I use that particular video because, um, like I said, I spent a lot of my time talking to um, employees, library employees, and I can't tell you that the number one thing when I talk to them is, they don't feel safe. They don't feel safe. They have thoughts, they have ideas, they have things that they feel that they want to do to solve problems, but they don't feel safe talking up for whatever reason. Um, they don't trust and they're scared right now. And I think that that's adding to burnout really because they conform, they do whatever it's need to be done and they don't feel like they have a voice. So what can we do? What can we do to make sure that they have a voice? So I'm gonna end with this, these statements that when we have a positive workplace for all, we want the organization to feel that you have everyone's back. We want to have people feel like they respect everyone for their unique skills, talents, abilities. We wanna have an environment that's flexible we want to pick people over policy. And one of my favorite webinars to do is blindsided at work because that's another topic of people feeling like we're not having communication. And then when finally things hit the fan, then people don't feel like they, um, they got blindsided. How can we pick people over policy? We work to diffuse and resolve conflict. Everyone can make mistakes without retribution and penalty. People can speak their mind without retribution and penalty. And when I say about workplace, we need to be active. These are not things that we can leave to chance or say, we want a better place, you know, or as Simon says, trust me, right? That's, that's not going to cut it. What can we actively do? What kind of committees can we bring together? How can we work together to get better? We can't fix what we can't acknowledge. So this is the book that I have if you guys are wanting to, to purchase as part of ALA. All of the different things that I talked about are in the book. And then also um, the different steps. Uh, I go a lot further into recognition and praise. I go a lot further into conflict. I go a lot more into teamwork and stuff like that. And all of those examples are the sort of the accumulation of all the research that I did over that year. Um, for the people who can't afford it, you can always do it at interlibrary loan. My interlibrary loan numbers are going up, up and up and up. So there's big enough for you guys to, I even saw uh, Sweeten the other day. So if you guys, for whatever reason, or if you want to test drive it first before you buy it, there's ways and avenues for you to do that. And if you want to talk to me um, separately, um, you can always send me an email or give me a call. I'm always open for that. I'm, as I always say, I'm very social and chatty, so feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thanks a lot, guys. Very open for questions. Yeah, well, it's, I just want to say thank you. This is, uh, this is really interesting. This is, uh, well, I think, one of the best um, workshops on uh, what we call um, uh, uh, great engagements that I've uh, attended.
Now, um, I want you to, you know, talk about this pe people over policy. I watched a video a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, not me, but there's a bunch of black people all working white black. And one of the things that came out is that the workplace is volatile, hostile to black folks, right? And then when you mention about people over policy, and this is because of the policies that we have, right? The policies that we have currently do not, are not neutral. You know, they are designed for single or, you know, male, white male or single white woman, right? Um, what about the single parents? You know, those policies don't, because sometimes you have the kids who are sick, you're gonna give them, leave them at home. Um, and so all those things. And so I want to talk more about this people over policy, because this is something very, very important that I think we should really, you know, think about when we create policies for their libraries. Thank you. Totally, thank you. Um, when I used to, like I said, I, I spent nine years of my life as a, as a director and, um, um, the, the, the place that I worked for was a um, punishment and penalty, guilty until proven innocent culture. Uh, there was no other way to describe it. It was uh, write them up and then ask questions later. And that was what you were rewarded for. Um, you were rewarded for, you got rewarded for the number of write-ups that you had every year because it showed that you were tough. It showed that you, um, you knew how to take care of rattle people in place and that kind of thing. What I learned really quickly is that when I first became a director, um, my staff were literally in the toilet. Their esteem was, they were last chance. They were on last chance. Um, um, it was to sort of to deride the, the museum because it was an African-American museum. So they put people there that had getting, gotten written up so many times, they didn't, couldn't fire them for politics. So they threw them into the African-American research library. So you can imagine, a group of people um, who were all on last chance. And that's what I got when I started. And what they were telling me is that you feel free to write them up and fire them as, as, as you can, because we already got a, a, a low full of evidence against them already, right? So we had to build up self-esteem one person at a time. It was one person at a time. I had about 40 people, one person at a time. When I say people over policy, um, we had one of our staff people who was a really good worker, um, really, really productive, but all of a sudden um, just wasn't making deadlines at all. The policy is, and the majority of the managers followed the policy. And the policy was, if they're not meeting deadlines, you write them up. And then they bring their lawyers, their grievance counselors, their whoever else, and then they, um, fight it with you, whatever. So I knew the person was pretty good. So I, we sat with them. That was against policy. That was not policy. I really would have, I would have been written up for that. But we sat down with them and just to find out what was going on. Come to find out, she was a single mom and had some, some family um, issues. So we actually rearranged her schedule. Um, and put her on a different time frame and move some stuff around. And she, her productivity started to thrive. And, um, and she thanked us profusely because when we started to see her thrive, we, I sent her my little thank you note about, you know, thank you for starting to make your um, deadlines and I knew you could do it, that kind of thing. I got written up um, because um, I didn't follow policy. Um, they were like, you could have fired her. We were trying to get rid of her. But instead of getting rid of her now, she is actually a branch manager of her department. So she went from almost being fired to a branch manager. But if I didn't follow people over policy, she would have been fired. All right, I have a couple questions now. Uh, Kimberly from the University of New Hampshire uh, states and asks, um, their organization encourages colleagues at all levels to give one another kudos at staff meetings. You have a few colleagues, though, who quietly criticize the practice, saying that it's just the same people over and over again who engage in the practice. How can they help them to be less annoyed by the practice? Yeah, I, I, 
I, don't, I, I know what you're exactly what you're saying. I think it's a multi-prong approach. I, I'm a little bit weary of, you know, kudos at a thing because what I was saying before, kudos usually goes for people who are ones being seen, the ones that are, are automatically doing a lot of different things or are much more visible. I don't, I'm not begrudging that. I'm an overachiever that usually got the kudos. So I'm not, I'm not uh, begrudging that. But it's usually the people who are already being seen. And when we look at that kind of kudos program, it really is much more of how we can acknowledge people for just doing their day-to-day -day job, right? Not the extra kudos for whatever. It is how can we people be seen for just being them? That goes back to what the uh, presentation said before, just being enough, right? Thank you. I have another question from Chad, if we have time. Christina from the University of Toronto asks how you bring up some of these great recommendations to senior leadership, especially when a member of senior le leadership is the <clears throat> whole. Um, I would always start with that whole thing that I put in the beginning where I said, do you agree with these statements? Every time I go, even when the, the top people are the jerks in the rooms, I ask them, do you believe in these statements? They, I rarely, even if they don't believe in the statements, they always say they believe in those statements, right? Nobody's gonna say, no, I don't believe in the statements. I want most of my people to not feel valued. No one says that, right? No one says that. So I always tell people as if I start with that statement, even when you look at diversity, start with that statement. Do you believe in that? Usually they say yes. And if we believe in that, then th what can we do to get to this spot? One of the things that I'm doing that my fingers are crossed if I have time, is ALA just asked me to do leadership um, strategic planning. So it's, it's more of how can leaders develop succession planning uh, that values people and values um, um, how to um, have be better at work in terms of how we lead people, the people stuff. And, I, and if I have time in my busy schedule, I really am interested in doing that because I am committed to exactly what you're just saying from Toronto that, you know, our leadership is problematic and we really do need to figure out a way to, to recruit people that are already got the soft skills. So when we are moving in this work, they have the foundation to do that. So, I, you know, if I do the, the course, it's a labor of love, but I, I do think it needs to be done. So thank you everybody. And um, if you have other questions, please come and see me. Thank you so much. I am so glad that Chuck and Ann invited me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. I know you've um, given us a lot to think about here this afternoon and hopefully will be the catalyst for some conversations once everyone gets back to their organization. Mm -hmm.